submit to you in writing, I'm going to have to deviate from what I had planned to do because of the ranking member's opening statement, uh, which I found instructive, if not predictable. So I want us to summarize for just a second. Secretary Clinton said she followed all State Department rules and regulations, but the truth is she did not. Secretary Clinton said her unique email arrangement was approved by the State Department, but it was not. Secretary Clinton said she used one device for convenience, but she did not. Secretary Clinton said she did not send or receive classified material, but she did. She said she turned over all of her work-related emails, but she did not. She said her attorneys personally reviewed each email, but they did not. So when faced with a series of demonstrably false statements, utterly impeached by both fact and logic, uh, the ranking member did what lots of criminal defense attorneys do, which is uh, blame the investigator. And when that didn't work, uh, they throw the Hail Mary pass of all criminal defense attorneys. Other people did it too. Which brings me to General Colin Powell, one of the most respected people in our country's history. You know, Secretary Clinton told the FBI, and I'll concede, she says different things to the public than she says to the FBI, but she told the FBI that Colin Powell's advice had nothing to do with her decision to set up her unique email arrangement with herself. Now, I'm going to say that again in case anybody missed it. Secretary Clinton told the FBI under penalty of not telling the truth that Colin Powell's advice, email, had nothing to do with her decision to set up that unique email arrangement with herself. Now, I will say this in defense of Mr. Cummings. Um, I understand why he may not believe her. I understand that. I understand why he may have credibility issues with anything that the secretary said. I get that. But I think it would have been fair when you are using your opening to criticize Colin Powell to at least point out the person you're trying to defend doesn't even say Colin Powell was the impetus behind her decision to have that unique email arrangement with herself. So let me ask you this. Secretary Clinton was asked, because she frequently says 90 to 95 percent of her emails were in the State Department system. Have you heard her say that? Sir, I can't recall. Well, it won't take you long to find it. She says it a lot, or she said it a lot. And then she was asked, who told you that? Who told you that 90 to 95 percent of your emails were in the State Department system? You may find her answer interesting. We learned that from the State Department and their analysis of the emails that were already on the system. We were trying to help them close some gaps. I like the word gaps. I guess if you consider the Grand Canyon to be a gap, then yes, there were some gaps in her email. Did you have 90 or 95 percent of her emails on your system? Again, sir, the only emails we would have is what has been provided recently, uh, which was that 55,000 that we got. Just well, I, no, I'm going back before that, Mr. Fendi. She said you already had them before she gave them to you. You already had 90 to 95 percent. Was that true? Again, sir, the emails that we're looking at, talking about the state.gov emails, she did not have a state.gov account. And as far as the emails that we received from her came at that time frame when it was turned to the department and it was processed by a bureau. But, but she made this contention before she ever returned them. She said you already had 90 to 95 percent. She was just helping you fill in some gaps. If you had 90 to 95 percent, why weren't you complying with FOIA? Again, sir, what I have in our system is what received by a bureau. Well, let me see and if I, I can put other. that in South Carolina terms that I can understand. If she said that you already had 90 to 95 percent of her emails before she ever returned them, 
That ain't true. Sir, if I may say this, unless she's talking about the files that were sent to other individuals within the State Department sent to their state.gov account. Well, how does that capture personal to personal emails? And how about the 14,000 that she didn't turn over? Did you have those? Again, sir, what you're talking about here. Oh, I understand her position. Yes, the fact that I didn't keep them doesn't mean that whoever I sent it to didn't keep it. I get that. What if it's private to private? How are you supposed to have Sidney Blumenthal's emails if it's private account to private account? How do you have that? Sir, if you look at what we are doing today, in, in accordance to the uh, Federal Records Act of 2014 that was amended, it requires that if an employee uses their Gmail account or private issued account, they're required by law to send that email to their state.gov account. That was amended in 2014, and that is what I'm briefing in the State Department briefs today. It sounds like it was a couple of years too late, but I'm out of time. was on assignment. The media's coverage of the presidential campaign has been a topic of heightened interest throughout the primary and general election season. Donald Trump's handling of the press was no doubt a decisive factor in his path to securing the Republican nomination. This week, Hillary Clinton's health is now the latest source of rampant speculation after delay in revealing that she had pneumonia. Brian Stelter is the host of CNN's Reliable Sources, which examines the week's top media stories each Sunday. From Los Angeles, Ben Shapiro. He is a columnist, author, and editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire. He was formerly a top editor at Breitbart News, and I am pleased to have both of them with me. Brian, let me start with you, and let me start with the issue of Hillary Clinton's health. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of speculation about Hillary Clinton's health in the news media prior to the revelation of these images, prior to her disclosure about pneumonia. Um, you called some of the speculation back then reckless. You called Sean Hannity specifically yeah. a reckless. Now that this news is out there, was it still reckless? Some of these figures feel vindicated today, and I don't think they should. Baskets are a popular phrase. Let's use baskets uh, for this. There's a basket of legitimate questioning about Hillary Clinton's health. And uh, some conservative commentators and media figures fit into that basket. They're right to wonder uh, about her health in some, in some cases. But then there's this other basket, a truly deplorable basket. Sean Hannity fits into it. So does Rush Limbaugh, Alex Jones, and others. These are people who bring up rumors and innuendo about Clinton's health and have been doing it for years. I'm not saying Hannity or, or Limbaugh fit into this necessarily, but they, some of these figures want her to be sick. They want her to be dying. They want her to be on their death, on her deathbed. It's wishful thinking. And that's some of this, this BS that's on the web, that's on Facebook. And the problem in media today is this stuff then populates our Facebook feeds and our Twitter feeds. And it becomes this innuendo that we don't just see on the front page of the National Enquirer, which is an offender here, but also then seeps into the public discourse. And that's why I think the Hannity's of the world were irresponsible. Let me ask you a different question. Do you think the quote unquote mainstream media yeah. should have been asking questions about her health before? I think the mainstream media Media was asking those questions. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily all broadcast, right? But I do think many reporters had been questioning her health, especially with her coughing fits and things like that. Uh, it is interesting to think about Friday to Sunday of last week when she was diagnosed with pneumonia. The reporters did not know until until Sunday. Partly that's because the campaign kept it a secret, and partly it's because it's very hard to, to get inside the inner circle of the campaign. And maybe on Saturday and Sunday morning, reporters should have been trying harder to get that information. But it is disturbing the campaign withheld it, and it's disturbing the campaign was uh, kept the press in the dark for 90 minutes when she left the 9-11 uh, memorial. Ben, you're listening to Brian here, and I I'm, curious, yeah. I'm curious where you <laughs> land on this issue. You know, when, when it comes to the, me the media coverage of this, no, I don't think the media were asking appropriate questions about Hillary Clinton's health. Chris Chaliza of the Washington Post five days ago, six days ago, wrote a column about why we shouldn't be asking any questions about Hillary Clinton's health. Then she collapses and all of a sudden is perfectly legitimate. You know, are you going to release your health records? Why do you have a consistent record of hacking this much? And again, none of that is, is illegitimate. I agree with Brian that baseless speculation that there are these videos that go around saying she has Parkinson's disease or MS. I mean, all this is nonsense. Exactly. Having, right. Having, right. You know, having Having doctors on the air to try and diagnose Hillary based on the fact that there's tape of her coughing is silliness. I mean, my wife is a doctor uh, currently in residency, and she wouldn't be diagnosing people based on 30 seconds. So then, what's, of them what's the appropriate That's way the to do it? That's the deplorable behavior. It's the difference between reporting and rumor mongering. And there's been too much wishful thinking, rumor mongering. What we need See, is, is less guessing and more reporting. Ryan, this is Jim Rudenberg in the New York Times. 
He writes a co uh, column called Trump is testing the norms of objectivity in journalism. He says balance has been on vacation since Mr. Trump stepped onto his golden Trump Tower escalator last year to announce his candidacy. Democrats say that Trump has gotten two billion dollars in free free advertising, free media, free coverage. Yeah. Republicans say that Mr. Trump has gone unchallenged. And I'm going to go to Ben first. Do you think there is true and utter bias in the media? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's bias conscious? in two directions. Do you think it's conscious? There's a conscious bias? Yeah, well, certainly, yes, obviously there is some conscious bias in the media and then there's kind of the generalized unconscious bias. Most of the people who are in the mainstream media are people who are Democrats and, and will vote for Hillary Clinton come November and they don't reveal that before they go on air. And so yes, unconscious bias has an impact on how people on how people perceive these particular issues. CNN, MSNBC have run chirons fact-checking Trump. There's never been a chiron on CNN or MSNBC fact-checking Hillary Clinton. So that's bias in one direction. In the other direction, I'll say that there's, there's sort of been... Uh, and this is true for the Trump campaign, there, there's been this kind of unconscious lowering of the standard of decent behavior for Trump in mm -hmm. the sense that they, in the sense that if Donald Trump shows up in Mexico and doesn't really do anything supremely noteworthy, this is considered a major victory for his campaign. If he goes into the debate with Hillary Clinton and doesn't act like an insane loon bag, then that will be a big win for him. Uh, so there, there's sort of a lowering of the standard because the new standard for normal campaigning uh, has been left behind. I mean, if they held Donald Trump to Mitt Romney's standards, then there's no way that he would have gotten nearly this far. Brian, you think the media is truly down the middle, if you will? I think there's a complicated definition of fairness in this election. Uh, not all lies, not all misstatements are created equal. And so sometimes you look at the Chiron, the banner on the bottom of the screen, it may not be fact-checking a Hillary Clinton lie because that lie may be more complicated, may be more nuanced, yeah. may take a whole lot more explanation uh, versus some of what Trump has said. I think in this election, fairness does not mean 50-50 coverage of each candidate and 50-50 treatment. These candidates are not equal. They are not even in that way. And I think Ben is right. There's been a lower standard of treatment for Donald Trump. If you believe that Donald Trump has gone unchallenged, why do you think that's the case? No, I, I think he has been challenged many times, but the treatment is different for, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, he, he has been up until recently very accessible uh, to, to television networks in particular. He's at the same time simultaneously running a TV-driven campaign, media-driven campaign, and an anti-media campaign. This is the definition of having it both ways. Uh, he attacks the press on a daily basis, and there are reasons to think he's a true threat. Uh, there are reasons to think he's a true threat to press freedom, even though he has recently relaxed his so-called blacklist of some news outlets. So that is all true. At the same time, he's been very accessible, answers lots of questions, and, because and can be helped. And, and to the extent that people think that he has gone unchallenged, it is because because of his accessibility. He's gone. I think it's challenge. because of this saturation, uh, this saturated news environment we live in. You may read a hundred stories where it feels like Trump is being let off the hook, where it seems like the press is going easy on Trump. There's a hundred other stories elsewhere on your Facebook feed where he's being severely scrutinized, rigorously covered. Uh, we ha we live in a choose your own adventure, choose your own news environment, which makes it increasingly difficult for the audience at home uh, to get through the right. get through the reality of the situation. Ben, I'm assuming that the assertion that there is balance in the coverage of Trump yeah. or that he has gone unchallenged, you will disagree with. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I wildly disagree with that. I mean, he's gone challenged on, on virtually everything. The problem with Trump is that he gives 10 different positions, uh, different, different positions for the same issue. And so it makes it difficult for anybody to finally get down to, okay, what does he actually believe about something? Because he'll just shift on a dime. And we've seen him do this in debate. So that's a challenge for the media for sure. But the idea that Hillary Clinton gets off scot-free because her, her scandals are just too complicated. I mean, the fact is that Hillary Clinton's scandals are not very complicated at all. She created a private server. i the banners for, on the bottom of the screen. Certainly, I know. I mean, she she'll, 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 she'll say things like... But, but she'll, she'll say things like, I never had classified material on my server. And the FBI said, no, you did have classified material on your server. And the, in the Chiron underneath, we'll say Clinton, colon, no classified material on my server. And then there's no parentheses that says not true. But they'll do that with Trump all the time. And so this, this sort of this sort of quasi, you know, even handed. It doesn't really exist. I mean, Trump is always perceived to be fibbing. And sometimes that's true. A lot of the time he is fibbing. With Hillary, she's always perceived to be telling the truth. Um, and then and then later, if, if it turns out she's lying, then the media sort of retroactively rush to cover it. This is what happened with the health situation. It's what happened with the email server situation. For months, all we heard about the email server was that it wasn't a big deal until the FBI revealed that it actually was kind of a big deal. I don't deal. know what shows you were watching, uh, but what I hear sometimes is a victimization narrative from conservatives. I would just point out there are many liberals 
who are equally frustrated by news coverage this year. Uh, I'm interested, Andrew, in, in how much anxiety and fear there is, outright fear among liberals about the prospect of a Donald Trump candidacy and how that's being, uh, they're, they're taking that out on the media in many cases. Let me ask you this. Um, both of you have talked about this issue of fact checking. And I wonder how you feel or what you feel the role of the journalist is supposed to be. We have a series of debates coming up. Chris Wallace from Fox News is going to be one of those moderators. Right. He recently said truth squatting was not his responsibility. That He didn't see the idea of fact checking on the fly being something that he should be doing. It's a show don't tell approach. What do you think the role of the journalist is supposed to be when it comes to these upcoming debates? We work for the viewer at home. We work for the reader who's reading our work. To the extent that the viewer is misinformed by a candidate, the moderator needs to help the audience understand what the truth is. Sometimes that can mean going to the other candidate and making sure the other candidate rebuts it. Sometimes that can be with a carefully crafted follow-up question, as, as you do on CNBC. The, the, the follow-up question can be the fact check. But sometimes I think the moderator will have to step in and explain what the facts are. The reality is, again, not all lies are created equally. Sometimes it is very hard to fact check what a grayscale story is. But some stories are black and white. And that's why Donald Trump is a unique challenge. You could argue he's the biggest journalistic challenge of this decade. It's not that Clinton should be let off scot-free. She shouldn't be. She does make misstatements. But Trump is uniquely challenging. Then you add Clinton to the stage, and this is the hardest task these debate moderators have faced in modern times. Ben, the role of a journalist, the responsibility as these debates approach us? I mean, I think that the role of the journalists in this particular case when it comes to the debates is going to be asking the follow-up questions. And I think that there are a lot of these fact-checkers out there, including organizations like factcheck.org, that do have a bias and where they'll, they'll simply grant certain amounts of credibility to candidates based on the political appeal of those candidates or the political leanings of those candidates. Uh, it, it's dangerous to me to have a, a moderator up there who says, you know, I, uh, Donald Trump, what you're saying about Vladimir Putin isn't true. Hillary Clinton, what you're saying about your emails is or isn't true because there, there are many interpretations unfortunately, of, of a lot of these issues. But it would be good to be able to say, you know, Donald, you weren't saying this a year ago. Here's a clip of you say, not saying this a year ago. And let's, pre let's, let's stop pretending that this is that difficult a job. It really isn't. We've seen these candidates really? for a year. We, yeah, it, well, it isn't in the sense that we know what they're going to say. I mean, if you've been watching wow. Donald Trump for a year, you can predict <laughs> what Donald Trump is going to say before he says right, it. And Hillary right. Clinton is absolutely predictable. So if you know what they're going to say, you should have a well-crafted follow-up prepared for every one of your questions if they say what you think they're going to. If right. the moderators don't step in, what I would say is the television networks, major papers have a real responsibility, even more than normal, to provide fact checking to the audience right after these debates. And then, of course, it's on the viewers at home. It's on the readers at home to actually check, to actually follow up, to actually look into the information ourselves. I know that we are so divided. We, we are so on our own sides right now as tribes. Uh, but the information is out there if we want it. Uh, there's more information available on these candidates than ever before. But we have to work harder to access it. Let me ask you a question about the mainstream media, and I'm looking at you because you, you work at CNN. There's mainstream, an, media. mainstream media. There's an argument that has been made that the mainstream media has not been aggressively covering uh, Hillary Clinton, and that much of the most aggressive coverage has actually emanated from some of what might be described as a conservative or right-wing media. I'm thinking of organizations like Judicial Watch, which mm. FOIA, Freedom of Information right. Requests, uh, for some of her emails, for example. Do you think that's a fair assertion? I think to some degree it is, and that's a valuable part of the media ecosystem, right? We're better off to have outlets that are explicitly conservative in this country, like Fox News and others. We're also better off because there's explicitly liberal outlets like Salon and Slate, not Slate, Salon and uh, Talking Points Memo and places like that. We're better off uh, to have that diversity and that variety. But I would point out the New York Times assigned Amy Chozik to the Clinton Absolutely. Beat years ago. The CNN assigned reporters to the Clinton Beat years ago, and there have been thorough investigations from mainstream media. Absolutely. There's just this distinction between outlets that come with a point of view, like Fox News, and outlets that try not to come with a point of view. Ben, I'm assuming you think nobody comes without a point of view. Well, I mean, I, I think obviously trying to trying to separate, as, as, using Brian's language, Fox News into the opinionated basket and CNN into the non-opinionated basket. I think anybody who objectively views both networks understands that there's an editorial bent to both of those networks. When it comes to you know the, the idea that, that let a thousand flowers bloom, when it comes to the media, obviously I agree. But I, I would point out a distinction. I mean, Brian, you sort of shifted away from the fact that Judicial Watch was named there. Judicial Watch has done most of the heavy lifting on a lot of the Clinton documentation here. Judicial Watch is not a media outlet. Judicial Watch is a 501c3 
every organization that FOIAs a lot of these documents from the federal government. And why the Washington Post wasn't doing that or the New York Times or, or you at CNN weren't doing that is a question that really ought to be looked at. Well, why, where I why disagree with to, you is the Judicial Watch now is a media outlet, that all of these groups are media outlets in the way the media that's, matter that's a real is a nonprofit definition. is. I would also say Donald Trump's campaign and Hillary Clinton campaigns are media outlets, as, as Ben Smith from BuzzFeed and others have pointed out. Well, all I mean, of these on, outlets it, now are media outlets, but we well, should it, take that seriously. Media that's is been everything, a change, media is nothing. But that's been a change in our media ecosystem, that all of these outlets now, all these nonprofits, all these companies are media outlets. It, again, it's harder for the audience at home, I think. It puts more of the onus on us to sort through it all. Okay, but the fact is that Judicial Watch, the way the Judicial Watch works, and I know this, I know the folks at Judicial Watch, yeah. is if they get a, if they if they actually receive documents from a FOIA request, it's not like they have the power of putting it in front of millions of people like CNN does. I mean, they're five hundred one c three. They pitch their information to media outlets, who either then pick it up or don't pick it up. So, the, so you know, putting everybody in the media basket basically says there's no such thing as the media. An individual with a cell phone is the media. Ben, I think you're a media company, I, and I'm glad you are because I can subscribe to you now. Well, I, I appreciate it, and I hope everybody subscribes to DailyWire.com as long as we're pitching things. But, uh, you know, the fact is, I, no, I do run a media company, but it's a media company that actually has readers and spends money to market our material, and we actually try and get that out there. Judicial Watch is, is you know, getting documents from the federal government. Why is it that, why is it right, right now, we know that the, the media are trying to unseal Donald Trump's divorce records in the Ivana Trump case. Why weren't they foying Hillary Clinton's State Department records? The Associated Press was for years. They went to court to get them That's and true. recently did. The AP was. And the, and the, and the Obama administration was trying to crack down on the AP for various other reasons. So, you know, earlier in this earlier in this this particular segment, you were talking about the fact that you thought that Trump was a threat to press freedom. I don't wholly disagree with that, but the idea that Hillary isn't when when obviously she's been less than forthcoming with the press, and Barack Obama has been maybe the worst guy for the press right. in, in the pre, in the modern presidency is is I think again just evidence of, of maybe bias well, on your part. It is not bias on my part. I would agree with you. Clinton is also in some ways a threat. Trump has taken more explicit steps to curtail the press. There are behavior of his campaign that are more troubling, but Clinton is no friend of the media either, and it would seem that either of these candidates would continue President Obama's uh, troublesome relationship with the media. Gentlemen, uh, on that note, uh, we are going to have to end the conversation there. I want to appreciate I appreciate it. It is a debate that is not going to end anytime soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both. Thanks so much. It's